A big welcome to all of you to Microbit Live 2021. My name is Varish Kendra, and I represent the foundation in APAC. It's great to see many familiar faces, friends, and family of Microbit Education and Foundation. I'm so honored to be the first one to greet all of you today. And words cannot describe how excited I am. This is the first 32 hours of Microbit Live, and I'm absolutely amazed to learn that our attendees are from 92 locations or countries from all over the world. I know that Pak Azrul is there. Selamat malam and selamat datang Pak Azrul. Abe-san, Maki-san from Tokyo. Konnichiwa. Jaiwan from Seoul. Anyo Haseo. And there's just so many of you. I hope we can catch up during this 32 hours. I'm staying up if any of you are staying up. And I'm super delighted to be here. A great opportunity to meet all of you again. Super passionate educators and champions in our communities. Uh, welcome to Mitch. Tracy from Scratch Foundation. It still feels like yesterday when we met in person for Scratch Day in Shanghai back in 20, uh, 2019 in December, uh, just before the pandemic started. Despite these challenges, all of us are still working hard in our own ways with many initiatives to inspire our next generation to create their best digital future. With that mission in mind, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our very own Northern Star, the CEO of the foundation, Mr. Gareth Stockdale. Thank you, Boris, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm a bit worried that you said you would stay up for 32 hours. I hope you're, you're not going to. And, and if anybody listening to that is planning to do that, I, I highly recommend you don't. Um, welcome to Microbit Live 2021. We're really stoked to have everybody uh, join us. Uh, I'd like to hear a, a virtual whoop from everybody, if that's possible. Um, yeah, I think I hear that. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So um, if you do hear a fire alarm, uh, it will not be a, um, a, you know, it's not planned. So please make your way to, no, I'm only joking. Uh, I don't need to do that sort of housekeeping because we're a virtual event. Um, but we are using a new platform this year, which is um, Hopin. We really like it and we hope that you will too. Um, a couple of hints and tips. Uh, for when you're using the platform. Uh, if you want to see the schedule as you're moving around, press on the reception icon and you'll be able to find it. Uh, the, you're in at the moment the stage. So this is where all of the uh, sort of uh, keynotes will be and the beginning and end sessions. So make your way back here for the keynotes. Uh, the sessions part is where all of the 35 minute and the five minute lightning talks will be. Uh, we've also got an expo area where we've got um, input from a bunch of uh, projects and partners from around the world. And I highly recommend if you get a moment to have a look around those. Um, it's an experimental area. It's the first time we've done it. So uh, we are really, uh, you know, welcome. It's really welcome for you to give us any feedback that you would like to. And also there is a link in the chat that you can click if you want to take part in that area next year. Um, there's the replay button. So that will allow you to uh, listen again to all of the live streams after they've happened. You know, there are so many brilliant sessions happening um, that, you know, I don't know which ones to choose. So you don't have to fear missing one because you can uh, uh, listen to those at your leisure. Uh, throughout the the whole of the um, event, as Morris said, it's a thirty two hour event. The the it is live for thirty two hours, uh, so you can listen to those sessions anytime within that, and all those sessions will be on YouTube after uh, after the the event's finished, uh, all in good time. Um, there is a networking area. Uh, so if you enter the networking area, you will be paired randomly with somebody and you will have three minutes to talk to them. Uh, it's sort of a bit like virtual dating, I'm assuming. Um, you don't have to spend the three minutes, uh, but it's there if you do want to. And those uh, areas will be uh, available for an hour after the live sessions finish. We're committed to um, Microbit Live being a safe and fun event for all. Um, so we have got a code of conduct, uh, which you can view within the event. Um, and if you do see anything 
um, that you want to report or um, anything you don't think is appropriate, then please contact us on help at microbit.org. So that's help at microbit.org, and we will try and sort that as quickly as we can. So that's all the, the housekeeping done. Uh, it's amazing to have you all with us today and all you brilliant people. And it's brilliant watching the chat and seeing uh, all of the countries from around the world that, that are, are represented. Uh, I'm assuming that you all know what the microbit is. Uh, if you don't, then you're in the wrong virtual event. Uh, but I don't know whether all of you know um, about the microbit educational foundation. So if it's okay, I'd like to spend a few minutes just explaining who we are as an organization and what we stand for. So we are a not-for-profit and uh, the microbit project itself started in 2015, 2016 in the BBC in the UK and the BBC brought together 29 partners to create the microbit uh, resources, um, teacher training and distributed microbits to uh, all year seven or equivalent children in the UK, and that was in 2016. The Microbit Educational Foundation was formed in 2016 um, uh, as a not-for-profit and was created to continue to support teachers in the UK uh, as they continued their learning with Microbit, but also to open the Microbit to all countries around the world. And that's what we've done as an organization. I'm just going to share my screen briefly if I am able to. And uh, hang on. Okay, I've struggled to do that, but that's fine. We'll go without the sharing screen. But I wanted to, um, you know, uh, talk to you about our vision. So our vision is to inspire every child to create their best digital future. And we think that digital skills and digital creativity are foundational skills for the 21st century. And we believe that um, all children and young people shall have access to those skills. So if you break down our, our vision statement, so it has every child in it. So we think our role is to broaden participation, to allow more children to take their first steps with digital creativity and digital skills. We have a particular focus on girls and on underrepresented groups. We think that not only will these skills allow for a better, brighter job prospects as the digital skills gap needs to be filled, but the concepts and, and understanding of how technology works will help all the young people take a better and more active role in the discussions around how technology should be used to shape our future. We want to inspire and we want children to create. We don't want them to be digital consumers. We think that physical computing is a brilliant tool to allow children to um, share, create, follow their passions and create solutions to problems that are important to them. And we want them to create their best digital future, not only to improve their ability to thrive in the future world of work, uh, to take an active role in shaping the future um, debate of how technology can be used, but also by diversifying those that create technology solutions, we can create better technology solutions that serve more of society in a better way. There are around 6 million microbits out there in the world, and we have projects in over 30 countries, um, and the microbit is available in over 70 countries. So uh, it's it's great to, to be here and to be able to talk about that today. Uh, a few thanks before we get started. So a thank you to Fair Chance Learning, who are our partners who you will see moderating and facilitating this event today. Uh, they are an amazing partner, and if you haven't had the chance to work with them, I, I highly recommend it. Um, they are brilliant. Um, thank you to all the speakers. We have uh, 80 speakers uh, from over 28 countries, or from 28 countries, um, who have given up their time to share their thoughts and their experience with you today. 
And also finally to say thank you to all of you for joining us today. I know everybody is incredibly busy and you know, for all of your hard work and dedication, you know, continuing to educate children uh, throughout the pandemic. But thank you for spending time with us today and hopefully we can all share um, our experiences and help each other. So partnership is at the heart of what we do as an organization and is at the heart of our values. Uh, we love collaborating with lots of different organizations and partners. And one of our favorites is the Scratch Foundation. We love working with them and we're so excited to have them here today, helping us to kick off Microbit Live 2021. Again, if you don't know what Scratch is, you are probably in the wrong virtual event, but you know, Scratch is the world's largest coding community for children. It has, it is used in over 200 countries in 70 different languages. Uh, we are inspired by Scratch as a concept every day. We are inspired by Scratch as a tool used by children, and we are inspired by what those children create using Scratch. And we are inspired by Shawnee Young, who is the, um, uh, the executive director of the Scratch Foundation, and by Mitch Resnick, who is the chair of the Scratch Foundation. And we're deeply honored that they are able to join us today to kick off uh, Microbit Live 2021. So thank you all for joining. I hope you have an amazing time and over to Mitch and to Shauna to take us away. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks so much, Gareth. We've had such great interactions over the years and we're so honored to be here uh, to help kick off this wonderful event. Thank you so much, Gareth. It's so exciting to be here, be part of the Microbit family and excited to, to share a little bit more with everyone about the work we've been doing at the Scratch Foundation. And it's great to have such a community of educators, you know, gathering from around the world. Because again, it's a big part of what we do with Scratch is trying to see how we can support educators around the world, uh, just as the Microbit Foundation does, uh, to make sure that we provide them with new opportunities to support young people in creative uh, explorations. Absolutely. And Ashley, with that, we'll talk a little bit about the launch of the Scratch Education Collaborative, which I'm excited to share that the Microbit Foundation is one of our partners in that work. And we've really been seeing a huge impact in ensuring that kids around the world have the opportunity to create and learn and share. Good morning, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you. So uh, here, uh, here, I think Sean and I are both uh, it's around seven o'clock at this time. So it's a, a good way to start the day. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I like jumped out of bed and was like, I'm ready to go. So uh, I, I apologize if, if my voice is a little raspy, but really, really excited to be here and to co-present with Mitch on the work we've been doing at the foundation. Yeah. Well, the past year has really been a really sort of exciting and transformational year you know, for Scratch. You know, although there's been, of course, so many hardships around the world, it's just tragic the way you know, that the pandemic has affected so many educators and children around the world, often having its, you know, sort of deepest impact in those who, you know, are already facing many challenges. But through all of that, we've continued to be inspired by the work of educators around the world, of how through all of this, you know, they've, you know, taken it on creatively to open up new opportunities to help young people around the world to be able to express themselves, connect with one another, uh, and to meet a lot of the sort of the mission goals of both Microbit and Scratch. So it's been really inspiring to us to see the way the educators have, 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 have joined together and, and expressed their creativity, you know, during these challenging times. Absolutely, Mitch. I think about, I was a science teacher, a science educator, and how meaningful and impactful that work was. And just imagining what that would be like in the midst of a pandemic where you just want to make sure your kids are okay. And you want to ensure that they still have this opportunity to learn and create, uh, but everything is just turned upside down in a moment. So I just want to say for, uh, take a moment to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Scratch Foundation thanks you for your commitment to our kids around the world. We want to do whatever we can to continue to support you as we go along this journey together. I mean, on Scratch, it's really led to a real surge of activity on Scratch as young people and educators, even while isolated in their homes, have come to Scratch as, as a safe space to be able to express themselves creatively and connect with one another. So I think in the past year, I think activity on, this, on the Scratch website is like doubled in the past year. There are like 30 million kids around the world who created projects with Scratch in the past year. 
Absolutely. Um, also, I started as a, the, the foundation executive director last November, so it's in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, the team had already revamped Scratch uh, Day to Scratch Month over the summer to make sure that kids and educators have a chance to really engage with Scratch. Uh, we created more virtual events. We also created opportunities for families to do Scratch virtually. So we've been active trying to think to learn about the needs of our community and, and meet those needs head on. Yeah, well, it's really been a really you know active year, uh, both for Scratch as an organization, as you know, Shauna mentioned, she started a year ago, and just shortly before that is when Scratch moved out of MIT. As some of you know, Scratch started in my research group at the MIT Media Lab, which is that Scratch grew and grew, and educators like all of you around the world were using Scratch and helping to support it in many different ways. It sort of outgrew our group at MIT, so we moved it to this you know, separate independent nonprofit, the Scratch Foundation, uh, and brought in you know, Sean as executive director to help build a sustainable organization to support all of that activity around the world. Absolutely. And um, just quickly note that we started the year of 2021 launching the Scratch Lab, which was a great creative way for our kids and educators to really test out new technologies, new blocks um, in a separate space. And so that's still available for those who might want to learn a little bit about Scratch Lab. I think one thing that, that Sean and I both really feel is that at the same time that we're you know, you know, building this organization, we're also continuing to work at building the educational movement because we see Scratch as much more than just a programming language. You know, many people might see Scratch as a you know, easy to use programming language, which it is. And it's also an online community where young people can share their creations. So when they create games and stories and animations with Scratch, they can share it in an online community and get inspired by what others create and get encouragement and feedback from others. But in addition to being a programming language and a community, we do see Scratch as an educational movement, bringing a new approach to education that I think is very much aligned with what Gareth was talking about, what Microsoft Education Foundation is also looking to do, to try to bring a new approach to education, to open up opportunities for, for all children to be able to imagine, create, share, and learn. Absolutely. Um, for me, I, I know that starting with the foundation and and thinking about my next opportunity, when I learned about like Scratch, it, I knew about Scratch already, but it wasn't just a platform. It's a movement. I was like, sign me up. I'm all for an educational movement because I truly believe that we want to ensure that kids have the same opportunities around the world, regardless of their economic backgrounds, regardless of where they live. I was really excited to hear and get to know Garrett and the Microbit Foundation for the work that they're doing in terms of anchoring their work in diversity, equity, inclusion. Our foundation is doing the same. We know that we have to do more, that just being free of charge is not enough in terms of a platform, that we're working together with Microbit Foundation to think about and be in the communities around the world who have, in many cases, the least amount of access to, to Microbits and to, to Scratch as a technology, a platform, and an educational movement. And, then, and this year, as, as Shauna led a strategic planning you know, effort you know, at, the, at the Scratch Foundation, as we came up with thinking about the vision for Scratch, it wasn't just about supporting kids learn to code. We talked about supporting and spreading a creative, caring, collaborative, equitable approach to learning and coding. Uh, and I think those are really at the core of what you know, the Scratch you know, vision is about, is supporting, allowing all young people to participate in that type of creative, caring, collaborative, equitable environment. Absolutely. And we launched um, at the start of last year applications for our new Scratch uh, Education Collaborative. We actually launched with 41 um, organizations around the world. Uh, you'll meet some of them here today. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the story, we knew that we wanted to do more of this work in communities and that as a foundation, it's best to partner with those who are doing the work in the communities. So we launched our application. We had over 325 organizations around the world apply to be a part of the Scratch Education Collaborative. I don't want to steal too much thunder of Elaine Atherton, our director, who will be sharing more about the, the collaborative, but really would like to say thank you for so many of you. I'm sure you're also with us here today, this morning in Boston for Mitch and I at Microbit Live. 
and we're excited to hear more about the work that's being done and for you to learn more about what we're doing at the foundation. And again, thank you so much, Gareth and Michael Bitt Foundation for uh, really partnering with us on this important work. And we see many of those organizations that are doing really, you know, work creative uses of Scratch. Many of them are connecting with Microbit as well. I think it really speaks to that close connection. Uh, and I think we see, as I was thinking about, you know, uh, this session, I was realizing there are really two different types of connections that we talk about between Scratch and Microbit. There's sort of the sort of physical connection that it's possible to use Scratch to program your Microbit to get use the microbit sensors to con for kids can use the microbit uh, and program the sensors to control their games and animations on the screen. So there's that, the connection just within a scratch project and a microbit project, but there's also a deeper educational connection that between the two organizations that both organizations have this deep commitment to creativity and equity in the work that they do. So we're really proud of this connection uh, to do that. Um, Maybe to, maybe I was going to bring it up by giving some examples. Okay. Yes, Just, I was going to say, Mitch, I know you have some stories. Please yeah. share some stories. Because you know, I think that it's been great. Actually, it was great to see Juarez kicked off the conference because I have such great memories. Uh, he was mentioning seeing me right before the pandemic at a workshop in Shanghai. And I've been with him at workshops in Shanghai and Hong Kong and Seoul, Korea, and also Texas in the United States. So all over of bringing Scratch and a micro bit together and just see the creativity that, that grows out of that combination. I was gonna show some images uh, from one of those workshops to give you a sense of what it is that kids are doing when they bring Scratch and Microbit together. Now, I'm gonna try to share my screen. I know Gareth wasn't able to do it, so I hope I have a little better luck to do this. Let's give it a try. Uh, and I think I'm getting there. There, hopefully you can now see that. Um, so these are images from a workshop. Actually, this is in Korea. One of uh, a group that we've worked with over the years uh, is at Future Lab, a wonderful maker space that's organized by the Smilegate Foundation. And they've been really active users of both Scratch and Microbit. So this is a workshop with a group of kids. I think they were like maybe you know 10 to you know 12 years old. Uh, and I think one thing you can see here is that one of the things that we love about the microbit and scratch combination is that kids get to do two types of creating and making. They're both creating physical things in the world. Like you can see in the top left photo, they're creating, uh, the kids created out of different craft materials, a steering wheel for a car. And then on the screen, they created a scratch project of a, of a driving game. So they're both creating in the physical world and creating in the coding and virtual worlds. Uh, and since we're really dedicated to helping kids develop as creative thinkers, well, the best way to cultivate creativity is by giving kids opportunities to create. And I think both Microbit and Scratch give kids these opportunities to create. So if you just look at some of these other examples, I think in the top right, they were embedding a Microbit in an egg because it was a story about some fantasy where an egg was this magical egg and they embedded the, the micro bit and the egg and it interacted with the scratch project. Uh, or on the lower left, they were using craft materials. And again, I just love all the different materials you see there. There's felt and construction paper and glue sticks. Uh, so it's not just about electronics and coding, but creating with all types of materials. If I remember right, I think they were creating uh, a, a, a hippopotamus puppet that was going to be used to control a hippopotamus on the screen. Uh, so there's a wonderful hippopotamus sprite in Scratch that these girls fell in love with. So they made their own physical hippopotamus to control it. Uh, and then the, on the lower right, uh, it was, and you know, again, you can see all the different physical materials they were using. And they brought in a little stuffed animals that one of them had from home. So again, it was bringing something very personal to them. And we love when kids start with something they really care about. So they brought in this little stuffed animal they really cared about and then strapped a micro bit into the backpack of the animal and then used it uh, to control through an animated story. Uh, so I think one thing I love about 
you know, the examples of this workshop, it also shows the diversity of different types of projects. So when kids do things with Scratch and Microbit, we aren't just looking to follow for everyone to follow the same series of instructions, like a recipe, and then come up with the same project. Even if the project works well, that's not what we're looking for. I think you can see here the great diversity of projects that are possible. And to us, that really is an indicator that kids are expressing themselves creatively. Uh, and we just know that in today's society, that ability to think and act creatively is more important than ever. Uh, you know, the world is changing so quickly. Uh, the kids are going to face a never ending stream of unknown and uncertain situations. So this ability to think and act creatively is so important. So I think for us, we always think about how can we help young people develop as creative thinkers. So I just want to show one more image. And this is what we call the four guiding principles of creative learning. Uh, and we call them the four P's projects, passion, peers, and play. And I think you can see that from that workshop. Kids were working on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. And we see that's where the best creative learning always happens uh, is when they're going through and, you, and that's what we always try to do is help kids you know, work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. So I think our image of the computer is not kids just sitting there on their own uh, and look at the screen and a solitary experience, but connecting with the physical world, connecting with other people, making all those connections. And that's what gets us so excited about the scratch and micro bit connection. Thank you so much, Mitch, for sharing those stories and, and connecting to the four P's. It's really exciting to see examples that we we know exist around the world. Um, and I really love hearing the history that we've had with Microbit Foundation. So I think it's really important to show that, you know, we're anchored in this work together and the commitment that we have to making a difference and impact in the world is really important uh, and will make a difference. So. We're so excited to have this, um, our presentation our, with, with everyone here launching out the Michael Bit of Live conference. And also would love to introduce Elaine Atherton to come in and, and share a little bit. We'll chat a little bit before we transition, but I thought it would be great to one, remind everyone of the work that we've been doing again with the Scratch Education Collaborative. It was just a little, I would say a little vision of, of five to eight organizations that we thought we would we have a, a pilot of a global impact. And really in the first year, it's turned into elevating the movement that we already have. So, so excited that Microbit Foundation is part of our partners in this work. And again, we'd just like to say hello to Elaine. We'll chat a bit and then uh, Elaine, you'll take it away. Good morning, Shauna and Mitch. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. And also, Mitch, thank you for the images. Just a great reminder that when we are trying to push forward and be the catalyst for the change we want to see, we really appreciate relationships with organizations like Microbit that allow us to be inspired and continue to merge the physical computing world with the digital computing world. And when you do those things, the possibilities are endless for kids. Yeah. So it'll really be exciting. I know the SEC is going to give a great opportunity to greatly expand those opportunities because there's only so much we can do at MIT and at the Scratch Foundation. We're working hard to continue to make this creative platform and a great community around it. But to really put it into practice, it's going to require efforts from organizations and educators all around the world. So it's great the way the SEC is, is helping to support that and to make sure that there's this whole network of educational organizations to put these ideas into practice. And really doing the work in the communities. I was seeing some of the comments fly. It's really exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone who's saying thank you for the work that we're doing. But again, thank you back to you being in your communities and ensuring that everyday kids have the chance to have creative learning experiences, which really makes a difference in how they think about uh, the world moving forward. So just wanted to give a quick shout out to everyone here with us this morning or this evening or this afternoon, uh, part of our, our Microbit Live conference, uh, virtual conference. Good. And we really look forward to hearing, I know we're going to get a chance now to hear from some of the organizations that are participating in the Scratch Education Collaborative. And we always learn so much from hearing about their experiences. 
Awesome. Thank you, Mitch and Shauna. Hopefully we'll see you uh, around later in a session. So want to jump in and just talk a little bit more about the SEC before we kick off our panel discussion with our participants. Um, as Shauna mentioned, the SEC is a we're in our pilot year. So it's an initiative that supports and engages organizations in collaborative learning um, and also connects them with partners in the Scratch organization as well as outside of the Scratch organization um, so they can enhance their uh, capacity and, uh, and to learn more about equitable creative coding. Um, there is a, it's a two year engagement um, where, and it's a cohort experience where we support organizations um, as they participate in workshops, they participate in forums and chats, and they also have the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one, um, development and conversations with the SEC liaison that really helps them to hone in on the development of a resource, um, an equitable creative coding um, resource that they will use to support the work that they're doing. Um, currently, we have 41 organizations in our pilot year, uh, 41 organizations across six continents. Um, it is a very, very diverse group from large scale organizations all the way to um, uh, even just independent schools and school districts. Um, we really could not have asked for a better group, honestly, to really partner with for this year. It's just been so dynamic. Um, one of the things I really want to highlight um, is our vision. I'm going to share. Anytime we switch to share, we always want to cross our fingers for a moment. Let's see here. All right. So I just briefly want to highlight um, our vision for the SEC. Um, when we were putting together this experience, um, we realized it was important for us to create a vision that was focused on eliminating gaps in access and opportunities to creative computing. Um, also to realign our focus to ensure that we are serving marginalized communities in collaboration with the organizations that are working directly with those local areas and regions and also to create a scalable model that focused on equitable creative coding. Today, you're gonna hear from three organizations that participate in the SEC. Um, we're so excited to continually engage these organizations and they have just been so phenomenal in um, just really singing our praises, but we are so much more grateful for them um, to be able to learn from them and to be able to partner with them in this work. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves. So if we can be joined, here we are. All right, so we'll kick it off with Rosa. Rosa, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Yes, thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you, everyone here at the Microbit Live. Uh, this is awesome. My name is Rosa Risti, and I am with Bridges to Science. Uh, we offer um, innovative math, coding, and robotics clubs and workshops for Hispanics, homeschoolers, and other underserved communities. Um, we're based in Houston, Texas, and we're just so happy to be here. Thank you, Rosa. I'm going to pass it to Marco. Hi, uh, my name is Marco Tulio. Uh, I am a product manager uh, in Brazil government, uh, IT service provider. Uh, I also a member of the Brazilian Creative Learning Network, and I am volunteer in Action Partners. Uh, Action Partners is a social and educational project that operates in the northern region of Brazil, more precisely in the city of Santa Barbara in the state of Pará. Uh, he, it's a small, poor, and remote community in the middle of the Amazon. Uh, we work with teachers, children between 6 and uh, 12 years, and have recently started to work with young people between 16 and 18 years old. Well, Thank you, Marco. And we're going to kick it over to Rishi. Thank you, Aline. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Rishi, uh, and I anchor uh, EdTech and Computational think uh, Tinkering 
aspect for the school school ecosystem of West Alliance. We are based out of Bangalore, uh, India. Uh, our our work uh, uh, is in transforming learning ecosystems across a school to work uh, continuum uh, with with key levers like edtech, capacity building, partnership, and advocacy. Uh, Mm, our work spans across the middle schools, uh, secondary schools, and the technical and vocational education, uh, you know, uh, landscape in India. And I think uh, in terms of outreach, we we are currently working with around six, uh, 1,600 plus public schools, and uh, in which impacting around four lakh plus students, and majority of them are from the underserved communities. Um, and and this is all being done in partnership with, with uh, almost 10 civil society partners uh, across nine states in the country. Uh, so yeah, uh, and that's where I think Scratch comes in uh, as part of computational thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Um, so to even follow up on something Mitch mentioned earlier in the keynote, uh, really focusing on collaborations and partnerships and how Microbit has been such a vital partner to scratch over the years. Um, we really took the essence of that idea and that messaging in how we approach the development of the Scratch Education Collaborative. Um, the SEC is only as good as the partners and with our partnerships with our participants like you. Um, Rishi, just piggybacking on something you just said, how does your work um, and the work of your organization align with the SEC vision to provide access and opportunities in equitable creative coding? Yeah, uh, thank you, Aline. I think uh, uh, I'll, before starting, I think I'll just like to give a, a bit of context before we get into how it aligns. I think um, when we talk about underserved com communities, our major focus is, is with the girl child in the public school ecosystem across nine states. So I think uh, our, our gender focused interventions are designed in a way that it helps them to kind of you know counter gender biases in their career choices and hence i think we work in building those critical 21st century skills uh, particularly you know for them to be able to pursue higher education particularly in stem fields and here i think uh, the focus is to build critical mindsets and not just being limited to those four subjects uh, because then it becomes kind of limiting in certain ways. So uh, I think that's where uh, it becomes very important to build those mindsets. And here, I think what is very important to also kind of, uh, you know, very, very cognizant of how, what is the context? We recently, we did a survey and I think the findings were really, really eye-opening. We we reach out to almost 100 plus students, around 100 teachers, 30 parents. And I think gender biases, uh, there's a gendered perception of abilities of the student, at least here in this country. I think teachers also view students as mostly consumers and not active creators or where they're tinkering, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if anyone wants to, I mean, I'll, I'll post a link uh, and it is also available on a website. But I quickly wanted to just jump in here to say that I think that's where it, it is very important that there's an immediate need to build mindsets and attitudes uh, when particularly when our work is with uh, with the underserved and marginalized communities. And when I when I think of our work and SEC's commitment to access and opportunities uh, with respect to you know, equitable uh, computing, I think both the Scratch platform and the workshop, the SEC workshop that have been uh, we have gone through. Uh, I think it, it takes care of everything. It, it, it actually uh, builds a, a very, very, um, you, you know, a, a kind of level playing field. Whether it's a platform where you have diversity of sprites, you are able to create your own sprites, or, you know, where you create a sprite to be, just break, break those gender stereotypes. And I think that's, that's the power of the platform, uh, where they are not just building, uh, you know, learning something, programming, but they're also building mindsets. And if I have to talk from an SEC perspective, I think it's very important uh, to also see how we are approaching 
uh, I think um, one of the uh, key takeaways for us is that what is this entire pedagogy of you know getting into computational thinking? And I think it 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 it, it does talks to cul how do we make it culturally relevant? And you know, so I think that that also enables access uh, equity, not just in terms of infrastructure, but also how do you deliver it? I think these are so many alignments that I can think of. Uh, and uh, I think all these workshops have actually opened our eyes in in uh, in certain ways, and also we see the alignments. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mindsets are so important, especially when um, you want to make sure that your the kids you're working with understand that um, creative coding is it's not just scratch. It's creative coding. It's playful learning. Um, it's building different skills um, in a digital world and also having those skills to make them transferable when you're also working with other tools such as Microbit. Um, just curious, uh, Marco, can you tell us a little bit um, about how uh, your organization is using Microbits to help kids continue to imagine and create and share their work? Okay. Uh, we work with a lot of resources and uh, we have a lack of basic things in, in this community because it's very poor, very remote. Then we use a lot of unplugged activities. We, for example, we use blocks, uh, we do the blocks of the scratch in cardboards and they uh, play in physical road first and because we have uh, uh, a lack of computers, a lack of technical uh, stuff, then we need to try more physical things because uh, of this lack. Uh, the, the region is uh, very limited in offer uh, cultural uh, structures for kids. We don't have museums, we don't have libraries. Then with the pandemic, uh, with the schools are closed, the kids are is on the, the streets uh, in receiving the influence of drug dealers and other things. It's a violence region too. So it's uh, very difficult to to work in this to, in this challenge uh, scenario. But uh, uh, technologies like Scratch and um, like Microbeats, we can show. Uh, for these kids, uh, they can imagine, they can work with another scenarios, we can work with another realities, uh, but these kids uh, in, in connection with other kids from the country, we have, we work a lot with partners because we have to offer uh, some uh, basic things, for example, like food for, for some families, then we need to to work with partners uh, every day. It's because the, the name is Action Partners. <laughs> uh, we use um, uh, Microbeat for activities like work, uh, workshops. We, we do workshops for teachers because uh, the traditional education don't prepare teachers for uh, use technology for uh, go out for the specific modes and we need to to show the teachers uh, the, these tools like Scratch and Microbeach. Then we do uh, workshops um, and these workshops is a way to, to uh, bring money and bring another resources for the, the organization. The organization is very small. Uh, start with one guy in, in the streets talking with the kids, and uh, we now we are uh, trying to expand it for another cities and Brazil. Thank you, Marco. I, I love the name of Marco's organization, Action Partners, because really what we see with so many of the organizations connected with Scratch is it really is um, we're taking action. We're trying to um, mobilize and be a, so, as supportive as possible. Of, I know our partners in uh, Bridges to Science in Houston, Texas, definitely um, are doing some exciting work with microbits as well um, to support kids in their imagining and creating and sharing. Rosa, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Well, um, we um, started out offering our coding clubs um, right before the pandemic. 
Um, so as in many other organizations, we had to adapt quickly. And one thing we found that while our students love, you know, learning how to program, they, for our virtual sessions, they would benefit from something that they could touch and feel with their hands. So um, we were, were really excited that we brought in microbits to our coding club sessions this year. Um, and it has been amazing because students can create things uh, almost from like day one. They use a scratch. We get a lot of our students have never had exposure to coding and they just feel very empowered that they can do something that it's meaningful, it's playful and it's fun for them. Um, and we we really uh, enjoy it. And let me tell you, on day one, this was like a great experience. Our students, um, we have one student who has done a lot of scratch coding. So everybody looks up to him and he shared a project that he did with sounds. But likewise, one student who had never done um, anything with microbit or scratch, he brought in and shared his project and he was equally as happy. So at that moment, we knew we had a winning equation because um, it was it's about bringing access um, to them to uh, wherever they are at whether they have had some experience or whether they have had none. So it has been very empowering for our students and they love microbit to the point that the other day, one of our students um, made a game that is using a scratch, but the microbit is acts as the controller so they could move. Um, they call it the hungry snake or something like that. So it was a, an impromptu and the students said, look, I have this to share. I want to, um, let you all know how you can do it and how you can adapt this scratch project to do things like this. And I was expecting that maybe just a couple of this. Was, so I told them, well, you can continue. I'll stay with you all. And, and the TAs were willing. Uh, long story short, uh, the majority of the classes stay past the hour. Um, for another half an hour to explore this project. So this goes to tell you in an age where our students are like um, fatigue of virtual meetings, just to see that kids are excited and they were participating and wanting to learn, um, I, we feel very privileged that they think of our sessions that way. But I think it's because of how they can create and imagine using Scratch and Microbit and, and these technologies that are meaningful to them. Thank you, Rosa. Rishi, I saw some great uh, images that you shared of the girls um, just tinkering and doing different things. Can you share a little bit more about uh, some of your organization Quest Alliance's work um, with your kids and Microbit? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, we have just started uh, so I think uh, one is this one is this entire vision that we have. Another is also, uh, we have just finished certain trainings, and I think uh, first I'll give a bit of how, how it looks like. I think we have this, uh, we offer first, we under the umbrella of computational thinking, we offer creative uh, computing experiences via Scratch for all our secondary school students. I think, but I think there's one curriculum that we have just uh, uh, built and we are piloting it is the advanced coding curriculum there. We are there, there's a lot of focus on uh, you know hardware integration and microbit becomes an important aspect uh, in that sense and I think for us the goal is twofold here I think one is this bringing in pure tinkering uh, experiences uh, because in in the process of making just a final output the, the the entire aspect of process gets gets very underestimated so what is this aspect of messing up? Uh, totally takes a back seat. I think that's one goal that we have. And another is that how do we uh, amalgamate and with our currently problem solving approaches, which we which are very integrated to our curriculum processes like ideathons and hackathons. So what if uh, you know if if uh, out of an ideathon they have come up with an idea, how do we kind of use hardware integration to kind of you know. Uh, you know, uh, build certain things, uh, certain solutions. And and what we have clearly seen in our initial tra trainings that uh, this entire, you know, 
the amalgamation of uh, you know digital digital computing with physical has has, has got a lot of uh, uh, you know traction uh, particularly in the virtual setup uh, uh, as we talk we just finished one training and results have been uh, tremendous uh, people are building apps around the uh, around what also uh, professor esnik talk about is around, around passion which means something that they really care about and they have come up with various you know uh, variations and some great artifacts so i think uh, that way uh, it, it's it's a great uh, uh, tool in the hands of both our facilitators and students yeah i always say that um we think adults we think we come up with a great idea and then you just get a a, a handful of kids that just kick your idea to the side because it's so much more creative and so much more innovative um we're all they truly are the future in pushing the ideas forward and i think our biggest responsibility is how do we serve as um great conduits how are we just a great facilitator of allowing that exploration uh, and allowing uh, kids to make those connections? Um, I, one thing I'm really curious about is the idea of transformation. And especially we're, we are still in the pandemic. We are still in a, uh, where a lot of our communities are struggling. A lot of kids are still struggling and trying to find ways um, to connect and still remain um, creative. So thinking about that, how do you see organizations like Scratch and Microbit helping to transform the way kids are learning in your communities um, and the communities that you serve in the future? Marco? Yes, uh, we use the, this technology to provide more creativity and critical thinking for the kids because we see um, the, the the youngers, uh, when you give the space for for him ex express yourself, they had difficulties because in the in the traditional school it's more listen to talk, then uh, they don't have this practice. They have uh, difficult to to imagine. Uh, little kids know. Little kids lo and, and look for the 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 tools and and start to work. You don't need to to explain. But um, adults and, and youngers, uh, they will uh, wait for the, the instructions to, to, to work. Then uh, we see in, in our spaces that we uh, are based in the computer clubhouse and the four P's of creative learning, uh, we see this transformation and the people start to think and do uh, what they want, uh, what is your patience. Um, it's for, for us, it's the, the most important because uh, we have um, um, a great gaps in Brazil, great diversity, but when you put uh, some uh, put people together and start to, to work in the projects, uh, this difference disappear and it just is a flow of creativity. Then it's, it's a very grateful to, to see when it's a work. And uh, micro, micro beach, it's very uh, interesting for it because it's a little board with a lot of resources. Then it's uh, the, the, the kids, the teachers, uh, every, everyone loves. Uh, for us, it's uh, a little, uh, uh, just a little problem. It's the price. Uh, here in Brazil, technology, it's very expensive. Um, when we import uh, technology, we have a lot of tax we need to pay. And here, it's three times expensive, more than the United States, for example. Then it's uh, uh, um, a difficult for, for us. But uh, we know we have a partnership uh, of the Scratch Foundation with a Brazilian company, Positivo, and we have an uh, expectation to see the price lower in the future. Thank you. That is a legitimate concern, um, especially I think those concerns have been amplified with the pandemic for a lot of different resources. Um, even just being able to get resources, when we're, especially as we're um, trying to remain optimistic and forward and future thinking as well. Rosa? 
yes. Um, well, um, we foresee uh, our communities, in particular, one of them, access is a big issue, Elaine. Um, they, um, I don't even like to talk much about them because I get sort of a choke usually, but um, they don't have access to computer at home, the majority. Um, when I ask a class of 20 how many had had experience with a scratch, um, three of them. So I think um, only three said they had, and I think something has to change. And at Bridges to Science, we're trying to create the ecosystem, and we're so grateful for SEC and all the organizations that genuinely want to help us because it's a big job, and we cannot, even for the most enthusiastic organizations like ours, we can't do this alone. Um, and our children need it. Um, they, they're they just so curious and talented. You know, when I brought them uh, this micro bit, um, I, I, was, I, I teach a workshop on binary arithmetic that um, opens their eyes uh, to children, like how math is in computing. Um, but um, usually that takes them an hour to grasp. But with a micro bit, you know, I said, well, let me just mention that those slides, you know, LEDs and RGBs. And I was amazed at how just by holding the micro bit and, and doing an exercise, they quickly grasped that concept. You know, um, it was just so encouraging. Um, they have so much potential, so many children, even those that have never had access. You would think, well, I need to they're just eager for this and they're ready and they're so capable and curious and, and excited that if only they just um, have access. So we're just so grateful for how Scratch makes this technology accessible, meaningful, and they can imagine and create. And just the future is bright. It's really bright. Um, and I am thankful for all uh, the ECC organizations and all we are learning so that we can better serve our students. Thank you. We're getting close to the end of our time, but I do um, want to uh, just uh, pass it to Rishi for a moment, just to hear a little bit about how do you see how, when you're thinking of the future in the communities that you're serving, um, what does uh, Scratch and Microbit look like as a part of that transformation to you? I think uh, uh, just, I think I won't repeat the costing with Anne uh, Rosa's concern on the access to the infrastructure because mm -hmm. I think that's that's the problem across India as well. And I think if I have to just throw numbers, uh, I think that that looks very dismal. So I won't get into that. But I think uh, what what Scratch and Microbit kind of enables is, is you know, mm, I think they offer very low floors, which yeah. means that students get to have the making experience, tinkering experience instantly. And thereby, you know, creating again, again, equity uh, so that, you know, uh, computational thinking or coding is not just uh, limited or there is no hierarchy of subjects. It, it actually creates a very good level playing field. And we have seen this very clearly. But I think what has been striking for me has been is that how it has also approached, uh, change our approach, the pedagogical approaches to coding, which has been very, very, at least in our country, uh, given the setup that we are and the mental makeup that we are, I think it's primarily very, very instructivist in nature. And sometimes we have to be. But how do we change it to make it a little more, uh, you know, constructivist where, where we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think essentially we see for them, uh, you know, being able to design opportunities with, uh, and, you know, think with their hands and, you know, hence bringing in this entire uh, uh, in order to, you know, bringing this entire aspect of head, heart, and hand in their knowledge construction process, uh, which, which, which is, which is, I think, very important uh, when we when we see the future. Otherwise, it will be, it can become any other coding uh, experience. Uh, mm -hmm. But as as Mitch said, that uh, it, it it is a movement. So how do we kind of, uh, you know, uh, build that movement? Uh, and I think both the platforms are offering that uh, segue into the movement, yeah. Absolutely. So as we come to a close, um, you just hit, set me up with the perfect uh, tee off. 
um, Rishi, where we want to continue this movement. We Our applications are open for our next cohort, our 2022-2023 cohort. Um, and we also have information sessions we are facilitating on December 10th. So if you want to take a quick picture for the QR code, it'll take you to our events page to register. And you can also visit our website and view our application and frequently asked questions. I thank you all again for just this experience and allowing us to be here. You've got 30 some more hours of um, programming. And so we look forward to seeing all of you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we've got the link dropped in to the comments just for uh, our web page as well. We're going to go ahead and pass it back over. Um, and yes, thank you again.